Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Broadcasting from Huntington Beach, yeah. California, and New York City, coast to coast. A big welcome from the Big Apple and from L.A. to all our listeners out there in Radio Land. I am Dave Nasani, the Caregiver's Caregiver, coming to you on the Caregiver Day radio show, live from the syndicated all-positive talk radio, HealthyLife.net, broadcasting in all 50 states and 135 countries with my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg from the Caregiverspace.org. Huh. And just a reminder that all our shows are available on demand at HealthyLife.net and our membership website, CaregiverDave.com, voted number two podcast of the top six caregiver podcasts by Caring.com and a bunch of others. And if you go right now to CaregiverDave.com, our free burnout quiz, as well as my first book about overcoming unbelievable hardships, are absolutely free. All you have to do is just click that free gift button. And we have an exciting show planned for you today, don't we, Adrian? We do. <laughs> if she says it, it's true. Today we'll be interviewing <laughs> Steve Seiler. Steve uses songs to help encourage and comfort caregivers. Isn't that a comforting thought? And he's a founder and director of Music for the Soul, a faith-based organization that uses songs and stories to help people find healing and wholeness. Steve is a Dove Award-winning songwriter who has had over 500 of his songs recorded by other artists, I assume, as well as yourself. And I'm, I just want to take this opportunity to thank my last week's guest, Mona Lisa Johnson, and her story of how she went to jail for 60 days undercover because of her daughter. That's a great, great story. And you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews on HealthyLife.net or on our membership website, CaregiverDave.com. All right, enough of that. Steve, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you so much, Dave. It's great to be with you guys. Yeah, finally. And I'd like to ask my guests to take a minute or two and just tell us who is Steve Seiler and why was he put on this earth? <laughs> well, I think uh, I was put on this earth to share the hope and compassion of Christ with people going through the world's most difficult challenges. Uh, and caregiving is certainly one of those. Um, I am fortunate enough to be the son of a father who care gave for my mom for the last 15 mm. years of her life. So and now it. I have, yeah. And now I have the privilege of, uh, of caregiving for him. Uh, I, he doesn't mm. live with me. He's thankfully he's still in his own home. Uh, but he does have Alzheimer's and it is progressing. And so, uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do to, to keep him in that home for as long as we can, where everything is familiar. Uh, had a long career as a songwriter, and uh, naturally I would think that uh, sharing uh, about caregiving through song is a great way to encourage and comfort caregivers, so I'm really delighted to be with you today. Yes, and you know, the, the message that we always tell caregivers, and, and anyone actually, is that anyone can be a caregiver. I mean, you're probably going to become one, or you're going to need one. One or the other, it's going to yeah. touch you in some form. And I'm excited that a lot of stars, well, I'm not excited because, uh, you know, it's a bad thing, but a lot of stars sure. are now becoming caregivers. And so that that's what helps get me on TV. I say, you know, uh, suddenly I had something in common with Queen Latifah and Hillary Clinton and uh, Henry Winkler and uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, all caregivers. Mm -hmm. And sure. there's more and more and more every single day. Well, so celebrities are, are people too, you know. Uh, and and like you said, everybody who, who walks this earth is eventually going to be uh, needing care or giving care and probably both. How do you guys get connected? Uh, he wanted to interview me, I guess, about four, four and a half years ago now. That's how we got connected. Then he asked me if I would co-host down the line a little bit. Yeah. Not immediately, but mm -hmm. he asked me and it seemed like a good idea. So here I am. I, well, what I love about it is that you guys being on, on each coast, you know, 
uh, yes. kind of underscores the fact that this is something that happens on the West Coast, it's something that happens on the East Coast, and everywhere in between. <laughs> I, I pray something called the share prayer, and it's just like, I just ah. want to figure out how to share as much hope as we can with as many people as we can. So. Um, I like that. <laughs> so, Steve, tell me, what is Music for the Soul, and how did it come about? Music for the Soul came about, uh, I was pursuing a career as a uh, pop songwriter. I was going to, you know, be, write the next great big hit. And I had my first hit on the radio, and when I heard it, I didn't feel anything inside. I didn't feel any of the things I thought I was supposed to feel after putting all that time and energy in. And I went into our church in the middle of the night, and I was like, God, I, I believe you gave me this gift of music for a reason. And I don't, I don't think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, in less than 10 days, I got a phone call from a total stranger who had visited our church on a Sunday when I happened to be, happened to be playing one of my songs. This guy called me up. He was starring in Les Rob at the Schubert Theater in Los Angeles. Mm. And he said, I've just licensed a book about childhood sexual abuse. And I want to do a stage play on this issue. And I want it to ha have songs. I want it to be a musical. And I think you're the guy who's supposed to write them. Mm. Ooh. And I kind of looked down at the phone and, and was like, wow, that's really specific. <laughs> you know, yeah. but I thought I'm going to I'm going to meet with this guy. And as soon as I met with him and saw the picture of the that, you know, the eyes of the little girl on the cover. I said, I don't know why you think I can do this, but I, I'm, I'm in. If you think I'm the guy, I'm, I want to try. And wound up doing that stage play, writing the songs. We, we toured the Los Angeles area for three years uh, in public schools, in, in uh, theaters, churches, all over the place. And uh, it was in the process of doing that work that I had somebody tell me, People have been telling me I was an innocent child my whole life, but I never believed it until you sang it today. Wow. When I heard that from that person, I thought, wait a minute, I'm supposed to do something about that. And so Music for the Soul is me doing something about that on a whole host of issues that cause pain. Because I think when people hear a song, they know they're not alone. And that's, that's what we all need yeah. to know, that if we're carrying a burden, others understand and have been through it. And so um, that's how it got started. Yeah, and right. I need to explain how I met Steve, uh, Adrian. Uh, uh, we yeah. have a common friend, Lynn Barrington, who who I met in Nashville because she sold me right. some uh, income property, and she's also mm -hmm. uh, goes way back in the music industry. You know, when she was one of the first women working in uh, yeah uh, for where did she work? I forget, but she was one of the first ones, just uh, you know, hooking up, uh, recording artists with writers because a lot of mm -hmm. artists can't write and a lot of writers can't sing. And so can't, it was a match made in propose. heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Lynn calls me up and she says, Oh my God, you've got to meet this guy, Steve Seiler. I says, why? He says, I don't know. He just, he just has anointed music and he, he sings to, to uh, the hurts and the needs of caregivers and other people of disability and 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 so we met and we instantly connected and and um, we thought about uh, you know perhaps changing the um, the intro to my show and he gave me a list of songs I listened to all of them and all I could find was one that was lively enough, you know, because sometimes, you know, he talks to people's depression to try to pull them up. Yes. But uh, we, we needed something that's, that's kind of upbeat. And there was one song that I really, really liked. What's it called again, Steve? Deep Breathing, I think, is the one you're talking about. Yeah. And I loved, I loved it, and we were cutting it down to the right, uh, you know, length for an intro and an outro. Uh -huh. and, and so I'm excited to, to have that on. Um, as great. soon as he gets that uh, finished, because you know he has to go to recording studio and doing this, and, and you know, there's no rush, there's no hurry, so it's at his leisure and his time. But yeah, his music, once you hear it, will just I, it just speaks to the soul. I guess that's why you came up with that name. Yeah. <laughs> How did you come to create a project specifically for caregivers? Because nobody is doing that. Nobody's doing anything for caregivers, you know. Yeah. But to have a songwriter as talented as you say, you know, uh, well, obviously, you know, because you're caring for your father, but it had to be more than that. 
to say, you know, I want to do this whole thing for caregivers? Well, actually, it, it was a, a very interesting thing that happened. One of my board members who, who came on board for a completely different project, but then it turned out that she was caregiving for three family members mm. in her home at the same time. Mm. Was caring for both of her parents and I believe it was her husband's father in their home mm. all at the same time. Three at the and, same time. Gee, Adrian, that never happens, does it? Got me beat. I had two. And, oh, my gosh, the stories that she would tell. And it was just and, – and then we started talking about – she had written a book for caregivers. Mm. Uh, and we started talking about the need and kind of what you say that, you know, that just said that there is not enough support, not enough resources. And right. she said, boy, it would be great if Music for the Soul could do a project just for caregivers. And I said, well, if you'll be the chief consultant – We'll get started. Ah. And so that's how it began. And, of course, my, my father was caregiving at the time for my mom, so I was, I was seeing it on, on a regular basis. Uh, and that's how the project got started. And I wound up uh, combining, uh, you know, personal stories, poetry, and interviews with songs, and in the process tried to create an, uh, an arc where we start and talk about the, the, the lack of dignity that the person uh, who needs care can often feel and then just moving through the, the different phases of the caregiving process, the different perspectives, you know, yeah. something for home caregivers, something for people who are caring from a distance, something from people who have hired a professional, oh, just trying to come at it, from, you know, a child caring for, for a parent, uh, spouse right. caring for each other, that sort of thing. So that we try to cover uh, as many aspects of the caregiving experience as we could. Yeah, well, this may sound like a silly question, but why do you think that, Music touches people so much more effectively than any other medium that I can think of. Well, there are two. It's actually not a silly question. It's my favorite question. So thank you for asking. <laughs> um, I didn't know this, and this is what's fascinating. When I started the ministry, I did not know this information. I started the organization because anecdotally, I'd heard the stories of the power of music, and I'd seen it in my own life. But what I know now. Uh, after having done the research and, and done a lot of reading and, and talked to a lot of smart people, uh, the brain science actually backs this up. We process language primarily in the left hemisphere of our brain. So when I'm talking to you, that, that's where you're, you're understanding what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We process melody primarily in the right hemisphere of our brain. So mm -hmm. the interesting thing about that is melody is where we process trauma. So the things that hurt us, the things that are difficult, melody goes straight to that place it, mm. and it, it moves the speed of sound obviously and, and and immediately can get right to the heart before we even have a chance to put up our defenses but when you combine a, a, a lyric with the music now you have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere so you have what i refer to as an all skate <laughs> the entire brain <laughs> is engaged then when you add the me the melody piece is also a memory device People remember nine times more what they hear in song than what they're told. So if I want you to remember something about being a caregiver, if I sing it to you, there's a much better chance that you're going to remember that than if I just tell you. And there's also a chance that you'll actually be able to receive it because it's going to that different place. It's going straight to the heart rather than into yeah. your head where you, yeah, into your head where you can deny it and say, oh, no, not me. It's, you know. I'm yeah. not, you know, I'm not worthy or whatever people think, you know. So it's that's that's the thing about music is it it actually bypasses all of that. Well, that's why I want to I want to figure out why do I lose my keys and my phone? I can't remember what I ate yesterday and all these these uh, terrible mm -hmm. memory lapses. But this song can come on when I was eight years old, and I yes. know the words to it. I can Every sing it. Every word. I know where <laughs> I was when it was playing, and I, yes. you know. And it, it's it's just made a connection. And I I also think about uh, you know how they say music calms the savage beast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I mean mm -hmm. even even in the Jewish Bible it talks about uh, you know King Saul who who wasn't mm -hmm. obeying God and so this this spirit came upon him this evil spirit and he was mm -hmm. tormented and the only way that they could calm him down was to bring in young shepherd boy David to play his harp mm -hmm. and all of a sudden mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. demons went away you know. Well, yes, obviously music is comforting, and when you put the right lyrics with it, it can also be encouraging, <laughs> inspirational. But something I wanted to make sure and remember to tell you, as you were just speaking, it reminded me, I went to a presentation for caregivers at, at a, a local um, 
it wasn't a nursing home, but it was a, a memory care facility. Senior center, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the lady was talking to us about what leaves the brain first when you're talking with about dementia and Alzheimer's, and she had oh. she actually had it all on a, on a chalkboard, and she yeah. had an eraser. Yeah, <laughs> and so she went to the board. She goes, okay, the first thing that goes, and she's erasing stuff, right? That's powerful. The last thing she erased was music. Mm. That's what people, that's what people hold on to the longest. And I was reminded of a time when I was playing a uh, at a nursing home, and they rolled in this lady, and and she wasn't speaking at all. And they said, right. you know, she'd be an opera singer, and she was just catatonic. She was just sitting there, staring off into space. I sat down at the piano and started playing. And that woman mm. opened up her mouth and was an opera singer again. <laughs> so it's incredible what music can do. Yeah, and it's a lesson to those uh, who run these facilities that, you know, you go into many nursing homes and they're just, the wheelchairs are lined up in the aisles and they're just staring mm -hmm. at the walls. And and mm -hmm. uh, I'll say, well, what is that? Oh, no, that one doesn't, you know, lights are on, but nobody's home. But mm -hmm. try some music. Try putting headphones on these people, yes. and you will see them come to life, yes. a personality. Yes. And so that yes, determines uh, a good nursing home and a bad nursing home. And nine out of ten mm -hmm. of them are bad. You <laughs> yes. know, it's like you got to find that needle in the haystack. Many of them I mm -hmm. wouldn't put my cat in. <laughs> right. You want the ones that are uh, not just putting people in the hallway so that they can, uh, you know, just have – Freedom to do whatever, but they're interacting with them. They're they're coloring, they're singing, they're they got headphones on, and so on. So, yeah, I thoroughly agree. Thank you for telling me the science because I didn't know that. Yeah, Did you know that, Adrian. No. Uh, yeah. See. I learned and something. Most people don't. There's a couple most of old dogs learning new tricks. <laughs> well, I know what's... that. I know that. I when I was growing up, I I knew the lyrics to everything. <clears throat> Um, you know, all every song, and I still do. I'm known for it, and I always said, if if they put my school curriculum to music, <laughs> I would remember. Mm -hmm. it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, we sing the ABCs to our kids, right? Absolutely. Yep. And and when I want to know what letter comes after the other, you know, like in the middle, <laughs> I've got to sing that stupid yes. song. <laughs> Adrian, I, didn't know, I didn't know you. Next time I'm in uh, New York, Adrian, you and I are going karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. Oh, I can't say, sing Steve? anymore. Oh, sure you can. <laughs> what were you going to say, Steve? Oh no! No, I was I was just you know I was going to say that the other thing that you'll notice is at uh, Christmas time if you if you visit a nursing home and start singing Christmas carols, ah, yeah. everybody ah. will light up. They remember all the words. So it's uh, mm -hmm. a, anytime you can incorporate music into uh, an environment like that, you're you're doing something really positive. Yeah, and I've seen nursing mm -hmm. homes actually bring children's choirs in, and, mm -hmm. and yeah. just yeah. you combine music with children, and you've got something powerful. Yes, you know what I mean. Yeah. So what are some things you've learned about caregiving in the process of making the project? I mean, because you, you already knew about mm -hmm. certain things because you're a caregiver. Mm -hmm. You're one of us. Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. else did you learn besides all of that? Well, I think one of the first things that I learned was how important a sense of humor is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Amen. There are going to be things that, ha that happen in the caregiving process that are just unbelievable. It's like you feel like if you tell this story, nobody will believe you. But but <laughs> giving yourself those. permission to laugh at the absurdity of some of the things, some of the situations you find yourself in or some mm -hmm. of the things you find yourself right. having to do, I think can help lighten uh, the burden a little bit just for a moment. And especially if you're meeting with other caregivers and sharing, swapping stories. I've had some, mm -hmm. some real belly laughs with other caregivers as, as we share some of our, our, our more uh, – you know, difficult moments. I think. I think the other thing, and this, I, I don't know why I wouldn't have automatically known this, but I think the thing, one of the first things I learned was that there's heroism in caregiving, and it's not put on the cape, superhero kind of heroism. I, I feel like I feel like what's heroic is that they show up. Is that these people I talked to and interviewed? It was their consistency. 
it was their faithfulness to the process. It was their willingness to, to be selfless day after day after day uh, yeah. that was so humbling to witness and so inspiring mm -hmm. to hear about and that yeah. I honestly find myself struggling to attain. Yeah, and they don't want attention for it. They don't want you to, to you know, fuss over them and uh, right. introduce them in a crowd of people, uh, give an award to them. They right. are very uncomfortable with that. They're just behind the scenes, just let me do mm -hmm. my thing, mm -hmm. you know. Unfortunately, 30% of caregivers actually die before their loved ones do because, you know, they, they sit there and they suffer in their stress silently. It's sure. like, what do they say, uh, high blood pressure is the silent killer. Well, you know, caregiving yes. is the mm -hmm. silent killer also. To and my hope third, would be that's a lot. My hope would be that, and I and I've heard from a lot of caregivers about what the music does for them. My hope would be that that that's what the Dignity Project does for people is is allows them to uh, let go of some of that stress, to feel their burdens lift away as they listen and as they as as they're hopefully encouraged and comforted, and and even though they may not want the public recognition in that moment, can feel seen and and heard and understood. Yes. Yeah, you're going Definitely. right for the juggler vein of the problem. It's stress. And if you can relieve the stress, even uh, subconsciously, they don't even realize you're relieving the right. stress because they're just, ah, uh, they're starting to breathe mm -hmm. again and they're starting to, I, you know, think again. Yes, Adrian. I have this sense that when they get a feeling of acknowledgement, it's, it's so important because um, they know they're not going to get it from the person that they're caring for most of the time. Mm -hmm. So when someone else acknowledges you, what you're doing is so marvelous, you know, like they might be very humble about it and everything else, but they do like hearing it because everybody will ask, how's the patient? And right. not recognize the caregiver. So right. it, it's a big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, I think we're up on a break, so why don't we take a break, and we will be right back. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. And we're back with Steve Seiler and my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg. I'm Dave Nassani. We're on the Caregiver Dave Show. And we're just talking about uh, Steve, who's an amazing songwriter and now is a caregiver. And he put the two together, and he's just doing an amazing project called Music for the Soul. And so let's continue this conversation. Can you give us a few examples of the kind of responses that you've had from people about the project? Well, you know, I was thinking about that this morning. That, that there's the consistent response from people is that, that, that they is that you know I felt like nobody understood, but th then I heard the songs and and now I do. But my favorites are a little bit more uh, unusual than that. One one lady had been caregiving for her daughter for several years, uh, who uh, passed away uh, in her thirties, and it had been four or five years since her daughter had passed away when she heard a song on our project called "I'm Gonna Lose You." And she said, after she heard that song, she said, it allowed me to not feel guilty anymore. I did the best I could. I did everything I knew how to do, and I, and I lost her anyway. And she said, that, that song gave me permission to forgive myself and to not take the blame and to and just get out from under all of that shame and guilt that I felt. So that was mm -hmm. a huge one for me That's to hear wonderful. from her. 
Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it works. <laughs> uh, another, another one was from a lady who was caring for her husband, and he was pretty much in a vegetative state. Uh, and she said that having the songs was like having a support group in her living room. She didn't have to go anywhere <laughs> or be with anybody else. She could just sit and drink them in and feel like she was surrounded by <laughs> I love and support. So that was great. And then there was one gentleman who was doing a talk for a group of caregivers who were caregiving for people who were severely disabled. And they were gathered in, in like a office building conference room or something. And he said at the end of his talk, he wanted to do something that he thought would be more impactful. So he played our song Dignity, uh, which is the first song on the Dignity Project. And he said around the room, he started to hear the sniffling and the, and he said when the song ended, the caregivers and the care receivers were embracing and, and silently holding one another. And there was just this long period where all you could hear was the sniffling and the, and the whispering. Oh. And the, yeah. So, I mean, it, he, he was so moved. And when he shared that with me, I mean, I just, you know, talk about a moment when you wish you could have been a fly on the wall. But, I mean, I just yeah. really <laughs> Yeah, well, you you obviously heard from God because this is a God thing, and it's it's doing things that nothing and nobody else that I know of is doing and accomplishing. Um, are there any songs in particular that are you know personal? Can you tell us some of the stories behind those songs? Oh yeah, there's there's there are two that are particularly you know, personal. One is called "We've Never Done This Dance Before." My parents cut the rug. Hmm. Every party, they were the first ones up and never sat down, and they were good. They were really good dancers, like they'd been to some <laughs> school. No, must have been watching all those movies in the '40s. I don't know, but anyway, um, you know, uh, when my mom, you know, got to the point where she couldn't move around much, naturally they didn't do any more dancing. And uh, there was a lady who had written a poem called dancing that we did include on the project and and she compares taking her mother to the toilet as being a dance <laughs> and, and, and so i thought well there's a dance that we've never you know they've never done before and i i literally with this song it is this is this was the first time this had ever happened uh i i woke up and the, the lyric and the melody to to we've never done this dance before was playing in my head literally playing in my head i woke up and went straight to the piano for the first time and, yeah had it didn't never didn't exist before that right right and is so it, that song is obviously a tribute to my parents is um, that how you normally get your your songs that you write they just kind of pop into your no head? Uh, no not at all that's what was so extraordinary <laughs> about it and i felt i truly felt like it was a gift from god for for me and my parents and I was able to play that for, for my mom before she passed. So obviously that was a great, great gift to me. Uh, and I really need to give my wife some credit here too, because when you asked why we did the Dignity Project, I, I remembered as I was sharing about We've Never Done This Dance before, when I was trying to decide what music for the soul should do next, my wife actually said, I really think you should consider uh, focusing on the caregiving project. So her, you know, uh, the woman behind the man, it, it's, she's not even behind the man. <laughs> Not in front of the man and smarter than the man and all that. But uh, she was very, uh, very encouraging and in favor of, of the Dignity Project. The, the other song that's really personal is the one I referenced before, I'm Gonna Lose You. Because I, I realized when I was working on the project, I asked Shelly, the consultant, I said, it seems like with most, most things, when you work really, really hard at something, there's a, there's a goal. There's an end reward right. for all your effort. I said, it, it, it occurs to me that the effort and reward here, the reward is that the person you love is going to die. What kind of reward is that? And she said, absolutely, and you need to write that song. And, of course, I was watching my dad care for my mom, and I knew he's doing an amazing job, and she's going to pass anyway. And so I'm going to lose you is my song that I wrote to my mom, you know. Wow. But in the minute uh, my husband was diagnosed with cancer, uh, I knew that. That's exactly what was constantly running through my head. I'm going to lose you. But for me, the the payoff, uh, the goal was that when he passed, I was there. 
and he and he was listening to a song that I wanted him to hear. As a matter of fact, I was thinking, wow. what can I do for him that'll make him feel better? Because he was uh-huh. he was really struggling at that moment, and mm. I put my iPhone on his pillow, and and he passed while the song was on. My hand was on his chest, and the payoff, as I said, was. I did everything I could to make his passing peaceful and and make his illness, you know, as comfortable as possible. So I had no regrets, and having no regrets is a big payoff. It is. That's that's so beautiful what you shared. You know, I would like to uh, play those uh, two songs sometime during the show, so maybe... uh, during the next break, you can mm. get them over to me, and while I'm still recording, I can somehow get them on. Mm. Um, all I have is the um, is the links, which I think have expired. I only downloaded the ones that I uh, uh, wanted because, uh, as I told before, uh, I'm uh, I'm going to be changing the um, the introduction to the show to the radio show mm. with one of your songs. Yeah, because, you know, I, I listened to a lot of them, and there was one that I said, that's the one. And I guess that's how we figure out what to do. There's just one. <laughs> anyway, let's take another break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. One Arm, One Leg, 100 Words, Overcoming Unbelievable Hardships, is about Charlene, a stroke survivor. Back in 1996, Charlene was a healthy, normal, very active 52-year-old woman whose amazing talents resemble that of both a Martha Stewart and a Wonder Woman. But all that changed when she suffered a massive stroke that left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. Who am I? My name is David. I've had the privilege of being Charlene's husband since 1975. We had a wonderful, fairy tale, storybook-like courtship that culminated in our marriage a year later. Charlene had just come out of a marriage where, after 10 years, she received two black eyes and a broken nose by her former husband when he came home high on speed. Charlene believed in no second chances of any kind for abuse, so she left. Finding herself all alone in the world with her 5- and 10-year-old daughters, Cynthia Lorraine and Deborah Lynn, she started raising them by herself for the next two years. Then fate brought us all together. After falling in love with Charlene, Cindy, and Debbie, Our love then produced Rebecca Elizabeth. We had a wonderful, normal life for the next 20 years. But today, things are very different for everyone. How about the reaction of nine-time Grammy and Dove Award recipient, the godfather of contemporary gospel Christian music, Andre Crouch? Charlene just won't let the promises of God go, and she has not let her circumstances get in the way of her faith. She's not just a survivor, she's more than a conqueror, as the Bible states. You'll be encouraged by her testimony, regardless of what you're going through. Available everywhere. And we're back with Steve Seiler, my guest, Adrian Gruberg, my co-host. I'm Dave Nassani. You're on the Caregiver Dave Show. And we're talking about a wonderful project, Music for the Soul, that Steve has come up with. and It's a godly thing. So let's go on with uh, our questions. We're going to share at the end of this some of the songs that he spoke about so that you too can enjoy them and be amazed and mesmerized by them as well, and then we'll tell you how you can get them yourself. So what kind of spoken word pieces do you incorporate on the recordings? I was listening to some of your stuff, and some of them aren't songs. They're just kind of this calm voice saying a bunch of wise things with some cool (laughs) stuff in the background. Explain that. (laughs) Well, on this on this project, we have uh, a couple of uh, pieces of poetry. Uh, we have people that have uh, written out their stories and and shared their stories. There's one story in particular about a, a young man whose grandmother had Alzheimer's that is just the most beautiful. I mean, it, it'll break your heart, but with the with the story and then the song that he actually helped co-write with me, it's it's just a, it's a beautiful moment. And then we also have done some interviews where we sit down with people who have done caregiving from a, you know, specific perspective to ask questions about what that experience is like. So our, our, our process is that the, the uh, songs and the, and the spoken word pieces alternate. So they kind of set each other up or follow each other up so that there's a, a continuity to the project in, in, in whole. Uh, 
um, you know, I wanted to make it possible to listen to the whole thing all the way through if somebody wanted to. It's about an hour long. Um, and the musical styles are fairly consistent. There's a couple moments that, that are a little different. Mm. But, um, but the spoken word pieces are really helpful, I think, because sometimes when a song just really takes you out, <laughs> so to speak, and you're up, really upset and you need a moment, <laughs> the spoken word yeah. pieces kind of give you a chance to breathe. And so uh, there are like 10 or 11 songs and 10 or 11 spoken word pieces you know, on the project in total, so like 20 yeah. or 21 pieces. And I would assume, and it ends uh, with an instrumental marimba solo of It Is Well With My Soul. <laughs> wow. And that sounds strange, but it is the most beautiful, unique thing. And I think people will really enjoy it. Good. That is so cool. You're, you're just, wow. This is what it's like to to walk in your destiny, to do what you're supposed to be doing, and, and yeah. you know, like you're you're not out there selling uh, pool equipment or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not a good salesman. I, you know, my dad can sell ice Eskimos, and I, you know, not just don't have that gift. <laughs> so, are there any other components to the Dignity Project that you haven't mentioned yet? Well, no, I guess I did uh, mention it a moment ago, but I'll just uh, reiterate that there is a, a book that we created, mm. and each each song has a story. Uh, you know, and it's not the story behind the song; it's a story that kind of mirrors the content of the song. And then all the lyrics are printed out. And I think, especially if somebody is in like a caregiver support group, to be able to share the the books and and sit together and read the stories and discuss them yeah. together you know, read the lyrics together and, and listen to the songs. I think it's a really nice thing to be able to do. So you sound like you've been to some support groups, huh? Yes, I think support groups are really, really invaluable. Um, Get some under your for the reasons, Yeah, for the reasons we've discussed. I mean, it's just that sense of not uh, not being alone, hearing somebody else. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was going to say, hearing somebody else tell your story, but as a matter of fact, I had uh, a friend call me yesterday and ask if we can write a song next week. His mom is uh, in hospice, and he's he's already saying, "I you know, I miss her, but she's not gone." Right. And so he and I are going to get together next week and work on that song. So something new That's around this whole topic. Song. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought so too. So, yeah. <laughs> So what does your wife think about all of this? I mean, when you first became a caregiver, not all spouses are very supportive because a lot of times caregivers' time is away from the family, away from the wife, mm -hmm. away from the kids, and and you start getting some complaints. You know, he should mm -hmm. be in a nursing home. How, how much time are you going to be away from your family? You know, we haven't been together or gone out in the next number of <laughs> weeks, and the kids need you, you know. They bring homework home. Every, you know, does any of that happen with you guys? Well, I think if, if if I'm honest, there are moments there, you know, there are just moments in any relationship where where this is upsetting. This is I think the thing that hurts my wife the most, it my wife really loved my mom. And she has a sort of this isn't fair. This isn't how it was supposed to be, you know. My parents were together for seventy one years, so it's not like my mom got a raw deal or anything. But <laughs> but by the same token, it, it would really be great if she was still here. And of course, in that cruel irony, my dad has Alzheimer's, but he runs a couple of miles every day still. He's completely physically wow. fit. He's in, he's in better shape than I am. He's 89. Wow. 89. My mom, on the other hand, her body betrayed her, but her mind was as sharp as a tack to the day she died. And you just look at that and you go, why? You can't help but ask why. You know that's not a reason. That's not a question that you get that's ever going to get answered on this side of heaven. Yeah. But but yeah. why? Yeah. It just sometimes you just want to say why. So I think that's what frustrates my wife the most. She's been very supportive uh, with the idea of keeping dad in his home as long as possible because of the routine, and she knows how important the independence was to him. I mean, my dad has said his whole life that he exercised because he never wanted to be a burden. And right. here we are. And yeah. why is he a burden? Because he's in perfect physical health, and his mind is going. Right. So you just, yeah, we don't get to choose that stuff. We just don't. Is he cognizant enough to realize that he should be depressed? <laughs> no, well, that's that's one of the good things. Uh, I have to give my dad credit. He still says every day, life is so wonderful. Okay. And, you know, most of his life has been taken from him. He can't drive anymore, which drives him crazy. 
I mean, you know, he, he's, his life is, is slowly disappearing. What's beginning to scare me, he's, he's starting to misremember the stories about mom. Mm. Uh, and, and I figure that's a precursor to forgetting her altogether. Uh, so that, all of that's very, very hurtful. But I'll tell you, he, he is, you know, you ask him, how, how are you doing, Dad? So good it's scary. Woke up breathing again today. I mean, he's, he's still <laughs> like that. And I realized that he could be other than that. So I'm, I'm grateful for his attitude because I think it's, for me, it's been a real blessing that he's like that. Yeah, well, absolutely. The running, the running brings up his endorphins, which, which make mm -hmm. him happier. Yes, yes. Well, listen, we're going to take another break. When I get back, I want to ask you about your personal experience with burnout because you're a caregiver. I mean, caregivers burn out. They, they make mistakes and they learn from those mistakes, but in the meantime, they suffer the consequences of their burnout. So we'll be right back. Don't go away. Our featured speaker is a best-selling author who has written numerous books and articles. He's a speaker, life coach, and host of Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program. He frequently appears on television and radio shows all across the country and has even shared the stage with Suzanne Summers at Harvard. But his most important role is caregiver to his beautiful wife, Charlene, for over 22 years. Please welcome Mr. Dave Nassani! I want to share with you a love story. In a couple of weeks, my wife and I will be celebrating 44 years of being together. My wife, Charlene, and I had a fairy tale storybook romance, courtship and marriage for the first 21 years of our lives together. One day out of nowhere, my wife has a headache, the headache of her life. She suffered a massive stroke and it left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. And in that moment, our world turned upside down. I gotta tell you, the next two years was like a living hell. I just didn't know what to do. I felt guilty most of the time. I became a caregiver. I didn't even know what a caregiver was. I was experiencing the same problems that other caregivers experience. If you don't take care of you, I can't take care of her. Well, that's why I wrote the book. Now I can teach other caregivers. I'm living proof that you can thrive as a caregiver. My wife and I travel now all over the world sharing our story. One day life is gonna call upon you to be the captain of your boat. Heck, you might be saving your own life. Thank you. Yeah. And we're back with Steve Seiler and Adrian Gruberg and I'm Dave Nassani, we're on the Caregiver Dave Show. And we're talking to Steve. I uh, want to bring up the topic of burnout, right? Because it happens, mm -hmm. and that's what you're trying to prevent. And uh, when I asked you before if you went to caregiver support groups, and you said yes. And is that for your personal support to, to vent maybe the frustrations that you're going through? Or do you always end up sharing and encouraging others with your, uh, with your project, or both? Well. Naturally, it's if I feel like something we have on, on the Dignity um, Songs and Stories for Caregivers project will help a caregiver, naturally I'm going to tell them about it, but no, it's for me. It, when, I, when I go to a support group, uh, it's going to be because I need to hear from somebody else that, that I'm not doing it wrong, that it's going to be okay, uh, you know, that it's all right to complain once in a while, <laughs> it's all right to be worn out. You know, all, all the things that make us human, you know, I mean, it's a right. superhuman task that we're asked to perform as caregivers. And I don't even have dad living with me. I know for those who have that right. experience, it's even harder. So, you know, I just feel like it gives us support groups, give us permission to 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 be real about it, to just yeah. be honest about our feelings. What was yep. the first what was the worst symptoms or manifestations that burnout? took on you when when you first maybe you didn't even know what it was when it happened until you I didn't even know I what would, a caregiver was when I was a caregiver I had to learn the hard way I would say for me uh, in, impatience was what emerged um, <laughs> that I that I thought I should be nicer than this but I'm just <laughs> I, I, cuz he was a great dad and he deserves my best and I just want to whack him you know <laughs> I think that's the, the number one symptom for me is that that short temperedness and that impatience that just doesn't reflect how I feel about him at all. And how long did it take you to realize that, hey, I've got a problem. What's going to fix this? Oh, gosh, I think I need to, to realize that again and again. 
Dave. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I do much better now, but I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, well, that's solved. I, I would just say that I find that what I, what I tend to do now is just try to smile first. Just try and smile mm -hmm. and remember that I love my dad and that he was the best father a son could, could ever have asked for and that he's not doing any of this on purpose. He's not doing this just to annoy me. <laughs> and when I, can, when I can remember that, I do better. And yeah, some days I, I forget. There's a book out there, and it's called, um, uh, gosh, bad with this brain of mine. <laughs> uh, Moments. That's it's called. Okay, let me do that. There's a book out there, and it's called Moments. And it, it just explains the dementia Alzheimer's thing in a way that caregivers uh, need to hear it because caregivers don't know how to handle dementia and Alzheimer's. You know, they they get impatient and they get frustrated and they say, come on, Dad, and then they, they, they think that testing your loved one, um, you know, what's my name again and what's, what's your daughter's name, you know, that only frustrates them uh, so much more. Remember we had that poet on the show, Adrian, who had so many uh, great poems about that. Yes, and, she was wonderful. Uh, yeah, and uh, gosh, we need to hook you two up because she, her poems <laughs> are amazing, and I bet oh, you anything yeah. you could put melody to them. She's from Hawaii, but she lives in uh, Stockton, California now, I think. But uh, basically, he says that uh, this author that caregiver um, that dementia patients and Alzheimer's patients have a moment. They may only have a thirty-second moment. They may have a five-minute moment. You know, think of that movie, um, the uh, the Notebook. Remember, she had a moment, and they were dancing, and everything was great, and she she was Clarity. back, and she remembered, and then she said, "Why don't we get away? You know, let's just hop in a car and go somewhere." He says, "Oh no, I don't think that's a good idea." And she says, "Oh come on, let's do it." And then all of a sudden, boom, she was gone. And she says, "Who are you? What are you doing here? What are you doing in my room?" <laughs> you know, and you have to learn to just appreciate the moments, and mm. uh, encourage the moments because. They they calm a person down, and maybe they'll be um, calm the rest of the day just because they had, they had that moment with you where you were laughing over something funny that happened, and then she was gone, you know, and and she feels good because she had a moment. She doesn't even know why she felt good, but you know, encourage the moments when they come, and just let them go when they leave because you're only going to frustrate both of you. So frequently, the music brings on the moments. Yeah. I always, uh, toward the end, when my mother was, uh, uh, you know, really bad with her dementia and she was in a uh, assisted living place, I would bring the headphones and and the the forties yep. and the thirties music, and we would sing Ooh. together, kind of like karaoke. And right. one, it was one of the very few things we could still do together. And when it was when we were done, when it was time to leave, she had a smile on her face. She felt good, and I bet she didn't even know why she felt good. But appreciate those moments and don't don't. Put him through the third degree. I remember one of uh, yeah. um, one of the the poems of that uh, poet I'm talking about. Um, she she had a thing in there, and it said something like, "Oh, here comes the the one who quizzes me all the time. So what did you eat? And uh, did Sally come and visit you? And I don't know. Just go away, you know. Oh, here comes another one. I like her. She reads me stories." <laughs> She laughs with me, and she touches me, you know, and and uh, you know that kind of things. So she just sees right. it from her eyes, from from. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna hook mm -hmm. you two up. So yeah, what I'd like to should. do now is play some music. We have some time toward the end, and I'm gonna play some of your music to hear, you know, just what it is you're doing because you know it's better felt than tell, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> so can't talk about music. You gotta hear it. <laughs> that's right. Okay, from this point, I'll play the music, and then we'll come back after the music played, and we'll say, wow, was that amazing or what? So uh, what what can I say? Uh, if people are interested in getting a copy of Dignity, Steve, how can they do it so they can hear this music and have it in, in their home, take it to their loved ones, et cetera? Because, I mean, what you do is, is work. This is what you do for a living. So uh, how do you make money doing this, and 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 how do you – uh, you know, reconcile getting it out to the masses, but still, uh, you know, making your mortgage payment. Well, we have a website. Naturally, it's called Music for the Soul, 
And the easiest way for people to find the project is to is to go to a Google search and type the words music for the soul and then the word dignity. They type those five words. It will come up page one, number one, and then they can just click on it and it will take them straight to the page. Uh, all of the songs can be listened to right there at the page. Uh, they, they stream uh, or they can download the project if they want to have the songs, you know, possess the songs. And of course, that's how we get paid. Uh, or they can buy uh, the project as a, as a physical piece, which would then give them the devotional book that, that I talked about with the stories and the lyrics printed and the CD on the inside. And then they can play it on a CD player or load it into their own, uh, into their iPhone. Yeah, so obviously a very, very small investment and uh, it pays huge, huge, huge dividends because we're talking about, you know, connecting with your loved one with where maybe nothing else works. Mm -hmm. so and you can awesome. revisit the music. You can revisit the music as often as, as you as you need to. And I think one of the things that makes it great for caregivers is that caregiving is so task oriented. You can mm -hmm. listen to the music while you're doing some of those mundane tasks that you that you have to do all the time in your caregiving yeah. role. Well, it's amazing how time flies when you're having fun here. Thank you so much for coming on. And, and Adrian, thank you every week for coming on. You're, you are at adrian at thecaregiverspace.org. That's your email. Yes. And your website is thecaregiverspace.org. And you're on Facebook under The Caregiver Space. And I'm at caregiverdave.com. And my Facebook page is Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver and Steve... If somebody wants to shoot you an email, do they just go to the website and do it through there? They can go to the website, and there's a there's a contact thing that goes straight to my desk. My email is steve at musicforthesoul.org, if they just want to remember that. And I should mention uh, that all of the songs are available at all the usual streaming services like iTunes and Spotify and Apple Music and all that as well, if, yeah. they, if they are more comfortable going where they normally go. That's great. God has really blessed your career, I'm assuming, by doing this in, in other areas as well. I get to do what I love to do with purpose, and I don't know how life could be any better than that. <laughs> That's great. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you again for coming on. and uh, Oh, thank you for having me. I I'm going to be in Nashville in June, and I want to I want to make the rounds, and I want to meet with you. So uh, put that on your calendar. I'll give you the exact dates when I get them. And Great. so I look forward to it. I haven't been back to Nashville in 12 years. Oh my! <laughs> Lost a lot of money there. I didn't want to go, but now I think I'm over it. Right? You got the, the you jilted, got the jilted love affair with uh, Nashville real estate, but I'm over it now. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, it was nice to have this time with you. And Adrian, nice to meet you. Likewise. God bless nice you. Nice to meet you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Keep breathing. Take it in. Keep